Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I wouldn't do that. You haven't heard anything yet. And if you I'm telling you, if you've been here today I it I feel real full from everything that's gone on today. I think this is the most wonderful thing, bringing Alan on and AA together. Um it was talking about it with Judy. You betcha. I was talking about it with Judy, and she said we're so alike. And we are. We're just exactly alike. The only thing that's different is some of us are a little more fuzzed up in the heads than the others. And whoever you think is, why, it's your gamble. Uh, it is uh, It's a privilege to have been asked to, to be here um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Julie and Dennis for allowing me to crash in their son's bed. And uh, that's neither here nor there. He's only eight. <laughs> and <laughs> some of us have all the luck, I guess, and some of us don't. And uh, Mary for, for picking me up this morning. And, and last night we had the most wonderful time. The most wonderful time. Where were we at, Judy's? No, we were at, who's where we at? I don't know, we were somewhere. <laughs> but we had a wonderful time, and about the best part of the time was there, not the fellowship, but it was this chocolate dessert. <laughs> and I will remember that for a long time. But, and it's good to see Beth. I haven't seen her for a while. Anyway, uh, my I am an alcoholic, and my name is Beth I um, was talking to the Alateens today, and um, I bought one of those things to keep a plastic bag in, and I also bought a God box from them. And they made these. And this is the most, I have other God boxes, but I want to tell you, this is the most wonderful God box I've ever had in my life. There are no slits in it. To put your little, you know, when you... You're holding on to a resentment. You write it down. You're supposed to put it in your God box. Well, this doesn't have any slits, so I guess this means I can hang on all my resentments, all my self-pity. And I love this box. When, uh, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I um, said to my sponsor, I can't wait until I know it all. And she gave me that faraway look. And uh, she said, I want to tell you something. She said, this is like an adventure. Because it isn't a matter of, you know, a program that works or... That she said, Julia, you're a lot of it. But let me tell you something. This is a way of life. And she said, this is an adventure in living. She said, what it's like is it's like being on a choo-choo or on a bus. And you're taking this trip. And she said, if you are looking into, you know, the bus station or you're looking into the train station, you're missing the important thing of the whole trip, which is the scenery. You're forgetting to look out the window. And she said, that's what this thing is all about. It's a way of life. It's getting through what you see out that window. And she said, let me tell you something. Sometimes there, there's fields of daisies. And she said, sometimes there's burned out areas that you pass. And in other times, you see beautiful mountains and sunsets in the background. She said, and then you get back to the field, the daisies, and then into the desolate areas. And she said, that's what this adventure is all about. 
And what this is, is how we live through all these areas in our life. And she said, you're never done. You're never done learning. And and that's the deal with this. You're never done learning. You're never done growing. And she said, this is why it's easier to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous and keep coming back. And she said, I'm telling you, stay here. Stay here and take the cotton out of your ears and shove it down your throat and you listen and you hear. And you take one thing home of value from every meeting that you attend. And write it down or you're going to forget it. And I remember in the beginning of, of my sobriety that um, when when something would hit me that somebody said, it could be a word, it could be, I don't know, a, a part of, of their life of recovery or anything, I used to give her a poke. And, and she'd write it down in a sentence because I shook too hard for the first six months to even write. And then I'd take the little piece of paper home and my husband would write it down for me. And over the years, I've done the same thing in every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous I have ever attended. And as a result, I have 12 notebooks that are that thick, and they're just full of the one thing of value that I've heard at every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the thing about it is, as I look through that, and I leaf back through that, what I find out is I'm doing exactly the same thing today that I did back then. And maybe that is why this is such a wonderful adventure. I, it's, um, you know, I've, the learning, it, uh, you just are never through. And I did say to her, the day I die, I'll know everything. And she said to me, listen, let me tell you something about the day you die. Day you die, you're going to the big meeting in the sky. And when you go through the gates, you're going in as a new person and you're going to start all over again. So get that out of your head. You know, the old battle axe, I can't, it, it, she is, she is phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, I'm supposed to tell you my sobriety date. Um, my sponsor already said, be sure you say that before you start, otherwise you're going to think you're an escapee from some kind of a loony bin when you get going. Uh, my sobriety date is... Uh, March the 5th of 1972, and it is by the grace of God and uh, people like you in, in uh, many, many rooms that I haven't found it necessary to have a drink or do anything screwball you know, take anything that's going to make me nutty or really that I am since, since then. I also have a sponsor. She said to mention that. <laughs> And I also have a home group, and um, I was told right from the get-go to get a home group, and, and I was told that the only, you never miss a home group. It's a place you go when you're dead. So I've had the same home group for almost 26 years, and um, I just have a love affair going with Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, May it continue, because you have given me so much. And I guess I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about what it was like and then what happened and what it's like today. And, yeah, I'm doing the same things today that I did back in the beginning of my sobriety. I still read my big book, you know, two pages a day out loud. And I've gone through big books, and they change. They change there. There, it's like magic. And and I write in the margins, and I underline the big books, and and um, I take a big wherever I go, you know. And if you're squirrely about taking, you know, a big book and and reading it on wherever you are, you know, on the bus, on the choo choo, or wherever, because it has those white letters that say Alcoholics Anonymous, and you don't want anybody to know who you are. They've got littler ones now, and they're blue, and they've got blue writing on them, and, and nobody can see what the title is, so you can sit there and read the thing. People think you're, you know, reading pornographic literature or something. Yeah, they don't need to know. Um, I still read my 24-hour book four times a day out loud. I was told to do that. I was told it's better to read things out loud. 
because it sort of gets it in <laughs> and down in here. And I, I found out that's so true, so very true. I, I, um, I'm still very active in my home group, and I attend a minimum of four AA meetings a week. And that's less than I did when I first got sober. But my sponsor said to me, it's important that you go. And I learned it was very important along the line because I've seen what happens to people when they back off from going to meetings. And and if you're never through, you know, growing and, and if you're never through learning, I, I just, myself, I and I'm not speaking for Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm just telling you. A little bit about me and, and how I feel. I, I just, um, I love going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so it's pretty much the same. And I'm learning a lot of things. When I was a little girl, growing up, I loved life. I love life, and, and today I love life as much as I loved it back then, if, if not more. And and I love to run in the sunshine, and I love to chase butterflies, and and I love the smell of of new mown grass, and and I love to lie back and make angels in the snow, and I love to look at clouds and wonder what angel lived on the clouds, and I wonder what God was doing, and and I love to have um, tea with my raggedy underneath a cherry tree, and and I I just I loved everything about living. And then when I was five years old, that started to change. I went to school. And it wasn't so much school. It was that I got laughed at. Um, I talked funny. And I didn't have a father. Uh, my first father was murdered at the age of 24 in a speakeasy in Chicago when alcohol was a direct result of why he's dead. Uh, so my mother and I went and lived with my grandfather, who was a widower. And uh, my grandfather and my grandma and my mom had come over from Aberdeen, Scotland, and, and that's how they talked, and that's what I listened to, and, and I had that Scottish brogue. And the kids laughed. No father talked funny, and um, I just felt real different right away. And, and I let that hang in there for years, even though my mother saw to it. I had nine years addiction lessons. And even though my mother married one of the finest men I've ever met in my life when I was eight and a half years old, I, I just kind of felt I was different. And another reason I sort of felt that way was because, see, the whole we had, we had a big family, and they'd all come over, and you know how families are. Oh, hello, how are you, little girl? <laughs> My, how you've grown. You know, and all that stuff. And then they'd take out bottles, and they'd take glasses and fill them up with ice and pour some of their stuff in the bottles in them, and then they'd drink it, and everybody get mad at each other and use terrible language, and they'd go home, slam the door, and we never ate. And I swore, swore it was never going to be like that. And and so and I knew that was as I got older. It was alcohol, and I swore I was never going to drink alcohol. And I watched my mother go downhill with alcohol. And and I was able to. Mom died six years ago, and and I was able to go and talk to my mother and hug her and love her and. Um, the way that you have taught me to do. Because forgiveness is a big thing. Forgiveness not only of ourselves, but, but of other people. And I realized over the years that my mom had done the best job that she could do. And she did a lot for me. And, and she gave me a lot. And it, it was a wonderful thing to hold her. And to rock her. And to tell her I loved her before, before she died. And without Alcoholics Anonymous, I never could have done that. So I was this glum thing, and I felt like I was outside a window looking in, and I went through life like that. And, but you wouldn't have known it, see. I wore a mask. And I wore a mask until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, till my sponsor said to me, you don't need to wear a mask anymore. In here you learn who you are and where you're going for the first time in your life. And maybe that's why... When I say I'm an alcoholic, I know who I am. 
And I know where I'm going. I'm trudging on a wonderful road of recovery with you on this adventuresome road. And it is an adventure. I, it, it, there are things that happen on, on a daily basis that uh, are just phenomenal in this adventure of life. And and so, um, you know, Mr. Wonderful came along all six feet, shoulders like the Rocky Mountains, blonde hair, blue eyes, a real catch, see, and I caught him. And I got into his 1955 Ford, and we drove off into the sunset, and I was going to get married, and everything was going to be great, and it was all going my way. Well, in case you don't know, and I'll give you a little marriage tip on the side here, marriage isn't like that. It's a two-way street. You give, you know, and give and give. I didn't know what love was. I didn't know till I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and you said to me that love means giving and not asking for anything in return. That you have no expectations. You love people unconditionally for who they are. And I didn't know that then, so I hated being married. And when my first daughter was born a year and a half later, I didn't like that either. Because, see, I like to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. Marriage just isn't that way. And and being a mom isn't that way. And and so I was, it had, I caught this horrible attitude. And, you know, and my sponsor calls it the Eeyore complex. You know, it's martyrdom. Everything is poopy. Everything. I don't know if you've ever read Winnie the Pooh, but my sponsor made me read it. The first year I was sober, and she said, you know, actually you could identify with that Eeyore person in there. You just read about Eeyore, and everything's glum. But, you know, that story, I'm telling you, that Winnie the Pooh, Take a, read it sometimes. I think it was written more for adults than kids. But, you know, so we were at a party, and somebody said to me, why don't you learn how to smile? I never smiled till I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when my sponsor said, well, you're running around all these meetings and reading the big book. Why don't you smile and give your face something to do so it doesn't feel left out? I've been smiling ever since. <laughs> So he said to me, and you never relax, you're always tense. Why don't you have a drink? And he held it out, and I forgot that promise I'd made to myself. And my arm shot out from this shoulder, and I grabbed that thing, and I drank it like it was a glass of water. It was a Manhattan on the rocks with a bunch of garbage in it. And I'm telling you, I almost barfed it up. And I don't know if you've ever sucked on a lemon. But it, it did that, and I didn't like it until everybody else has talked to you about that and told you about it, and you felt it yourself. It hit. Boom. And you can feel it all the way down to your corns. You really can. <laughs> oh, you know, I hopped in from outside. I quit, you know, peeking in that window. I came into the center of things. And, and from that moment on, I drank, I got drunk, and I got into a lot of trouble. It was drink trouble. It was like putting a snowball on top of Mount Everest and kicking it off, and then it, it just rolled down, picked up momentum until it squashed on the bottom. All those things that you did, I did. You know, and it, it gets worse as you go on. I, I snuck the stuff into the house. You know, I, I didn't like that whiskey junk, so I discovered wine. And I think it's like rocket juice. You know, it takes you where you need to go quick. And, and it, it, was, it was wonderful. The guy on the next street made Mad Dog. And it was absolutely wonderful. It had crunchy stuff on the bottom so you could keep up with your nutrition, you know, <laughs> and get your vitamins. And... Um, it comes in all different sizes, and they sell it everywhere. You know, it came in the large economy size and the quart size and the fifth size and the pint size that you could sneak in the house and nobody would see a lump. You know, and, and I hid it. it. It went everywhere. My favorite place was a douchebag. And, um, well, men don't look at notes. So... 
pour it in there, see, and put foil on top so the fumes wouldn't come out and hang it up in the bathroom. And then when I get the terrible thirst, I go in the bathroom and take the hose and unclick it and glurk down it would go. And that worked for a while till he found that and I heard about that. Oh, I did dumb things. I used to paint them white and hang them out the window, you know, because I figured nobody could see him because I couldn't. I went out and looked and I didn't see him. <laughs> and I think that, you know, I know this is a family disease because he called me out, you know, and he said, my God, Beth, what is that? And I said, I don't see anything. So he said, you stand right there. I'm going down the street and get Marty. Marty was his best friend. So I said, all right. And so I stood there, and he went down the street to get my, by God, when he was around those bushes, I shot upstairs, grabbed that thing, stuck it under the bed, and ran back downstairs, and I wasn't even breathing hard. And he came in, and he said to Marty, I want to tell you something. This thing, this horrible problem of hers is taking off. Look what she's doing now. And Marty looked up there and he said, I don't see anything, Bruce. Maybe you need psychiatric help. (laughs) And he went. (laughs) So. Anyway, you know, it progresses, and you, you know, you write, you forge texts, and you go at night, wherever you feel like it. And he got a little sick and tired of them calling from the supermarket and said, she's again asleep over the basket. Will you come get her? (laughs) And stuff. So, anyway, um, he said, after five years of this, he said to me, you've got a drinking problem. You're an alcoholic. I'd like to have died. You know, it, I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I just didn't. I wasn't like my mother. I wasn't like, oh, my God. I was not an alcoholic. And he said, if you don't go to AA, I'm cutting off your allowance. And those were the magic words. Because I was off the checking account. I was off the savings account. So he said, that word cut you off. And I thought, how am I ever going to afford anything? Because, you know, he'd, he'd squelch the pawn shop thing and all of that. So I went around Alcoholics Anonymous for the first of three times. I walked through those doors. I was not honest. It was everybody else's fault. Oh, I heard of, I heard you from the podiums. I heard about your job losses. I heard about your divorces. I heard about all that kind of stuff. Now, that hadn't happened to me yet. And I think that's one of the most important words we have. Because I'll clue you. If you go do what you did, you're going to get what you got. In spades. I wasn't willing to do what you asked me to do. And, and two years later, so some, smart neighbor called the social services. My husband was a sales engineer and he traveled. And people can't bird dog with the kids. And uh, the violence had set in. And it was a ni- not a nice situation. And, and so uh, somebody called the social service workers and they said they'd take away the children. Ever since I was that little girl running in the sunshine and having tea with my raggedy, all I ever wanted to be was a good wife and a good mother, and I didn't know what was happening. I'd stand upstairs on the second floor with that bottle in my hand, and I would watch my children waiting for the bus. And I'd see the other mothers out there, and their hair was shining. And I could hear their laughter. And and they were holding tight to their children. My children were standing over there. Nobody wants their kids around the kids of a drunk after a while. And I wanted to be out there. I wanted to be holding my children's hands. I wanted my hair to shine. And I wanted to laugh. And I didn't understand what was going on. And the pain. <laughs> I drank. I drink. I played the same game around AA. I went to one meeting a week. Now, you know what? I'm going to be 67 years old in about three and a half months. What grade would I be in if I went once a week to school? I probably wouldn't be out of kindergarten. 
you know, oh, there she is, 67 years old, stuck in kindergarten, because she only went once a week. I feel it's the same with AA. I've got to go to a minimum of four meetings a week. And I told you before, I'm not speaking for uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm just sharing with you how I feel. And I didn't then, and I paid the price. I had, uh, a couple of years later, I was in front of a judge. I was on my ninth DUI, and I was up on an assault and battery charge. Well, I was driving along the street, minding my own business, drinking. And, you know, when I was driving with my eyes shut, I spent a lot of time with my eyes shut. I watch TV with my eyes shut. You know, everything focused better. And I drive with my eyes shut, and I do everything with my eyes shut. I have 20-20 vision in my right eye. This one's got awful vision. It's probably because it was open all those years. <laughs> and this rested. Anyway, this soft berm came up and in the street, and I went in it. And, and I was rocking, trying to get out of there when the officer of the law came along, and he knocked on the window, and I rolled it down, and he said that famous thing, Have you been drinking? You know, because it's not, I so I only had a couple. <laughs> you know, it's an empty fifth, there's a half-gone quart, there's a full half-gallon in the car. And, and he said, I'm going to help you go home. I'll take you there. Well, I didn't want him to. What would the neighbors think for him's sake? So, uh, you know, I, he said step out, and I stepped out. And then he said yes, I said no. And we got into it, and I hit him over the head with my wine bottle. <laughs> and he had 24 stitches, and I got my picture taken with some numbers under my chin. And I was in real deep doo-doo, but I didn't want to go to the workhouse. You know, so I said, yeah, and so I went back around AA and I played the same game for a couple months. On March the 4th, and I want to say something right now. Do you know that hurts? Do you know how horrible it is to walk into an AA meeting and know you have fifths out in the car? And you see the people in that meeting that are doing their best to help you? And the guilt and that came from that was phenomenal. It took me a while when um, God gave me a gift to sobriety, and I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. It took a while to get rid of that guilt. By March 4th of 1972, in, in the kitchen, I finished everything there was to drink in the house by 9 o'clock in the morning. And I didn't have that awful feeling down here of panic and of fear because I'd run out of everything. It was the first time that I didn't think rubbing alcohol or I didn't think cologne or something like that to get me through. I just kind of sat there. And I watched my family go to church. Nobody said goodbye. You know, they just weren't talking to me anymore. It, 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 it came up today over and over and over and over again about what lonely diseases is. And to live in a house with other human beings and they don't talk to you, it's, it's terrible. You know, and every so once in a while you go outside and you wave at somebody that's passing by and they don't wave back. It's a terrible lonely place to be. And I don't ever want to go back to that. You know, my oldest daughter Anne called me mom when I was sober three years. And then the rest of them followed. Do you know my husband called me by my first name when I had two years of sobriety? And you know what you keep say, you kept saying to me? Stay there and do the things that you're supposed to do. Because that's what it's all about. That's what the sober thing is all about. It's you doing what you're supposed to do. And and it will come. On those faces, on that morning, I saw all the horror of this disease, all the fear, all the frustration. 
all the degradation, all the dishonesty. It, it, it was just painted there like a picture. And when they left, in the quietness of that kitchen, I knew something. That I am an alcoholic. And everything that was on those faces is because of, of my actions with this disease. And I wanted to live. I knew I was dying. It isn't that I weighed 64 pounds and, and um, it was in terrible, terrible shape. It was just that I knew that I wanted to live. And, and uh, I needed help to do it. I, I have to believe that that split second of time, that little part of me that hadn't been chewed apart by alcohol that I call my soul opened up and God zoomed in. I believe this is a gift. Now, I didn't say God help me. I would slammed the door on him a long time ago. But it happened. And, and it's the only, only way I can make any kind of sense out of it that it was the first time in, in my sobriety that God gave to me and did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And yes, I believe this is a gift. I have another drunk coming. I'm an alcoholic. But I don't have another recovery coming. I was given this gift to live again. And, and it's kind of like, you know, if you get a Monopoly set or part cheesy or something for Christmas, you know, and you take it out and you play with it and you're all happy and you're having a good time with it, you're so careful when you pick it up. And you put every piece back into the box and you don't miss any and you peek under the sofa to make sure nothing went under there. And then you put it on the shelf and the next time that you go to take it down, you can't because it's all intact. But if I get careless with that game and I lose a piece here and a piece there, the day's going to come when I take it down and can't play it anymore. And that's the same reason I don't want to get careless with this thing called sobriety, with this gift of sobriety. I called my Aunt Jean in Chicago, who at that time had 19 years of uninterrupted sobriety, and thank God she was there. Because I told her I wanted to live. And, and my Aunt Jean taught, uh, she would not only was there, but she's taught me one of the biggest lessons today that, that I hang on to. When my Aunt Jean had 20 years of uninterrupted sobriety, she thought that she'd had enough of meetings, that she knew it all. Six months later, she picked up her first drink. And three months after that, she died of internal hemorrhaging. I pray for her every night and to her every night. Because that woman was there when I made that call. And she taught me that lesson. You stay here. And she coupled with my sponsor, you stay here, you're never done. She asked me the name of an old timer that had never given up hope on me, and his name was Jerry Jackson, and he started a lot of the meetings around our area. I had met Jerry in, in 1962 when I was fiddle-fooing around with Alcoholics Anonymous. And Jerry came over and gave my family that hope. You know, that same hope we give each other, this is important to me, this hope. The same kind of hope we give each other when we're sitting across from each other having a cup of coffee, or we see each other walking down the street, or, or we see each other in a mall and we, we chitty chat and we, and all this kind of, that kind of hope that we can rebuild. What has been destroyed? And, and I saw that kind of hope one day. I was cleaning my house, and I ding a little spider web out of a corner, and down he came. And he looked like he was, this spider looked like he was right there. And I put my mind, I was going to give him a whack, and, and I couldn't do it. I thought, he's hanging on the way we do, into this invisible something, with all the hope he's got. And I watched him. 
you know? And, and well, not like a dodo head and stood there because it takes him a couple days. Every time I'd go through, you know, the living room, I'd give him a little peek. And he put one fuzzy foot over the other, and he climbed and rebuilt what was destroyed, his home. It was the most magnificent spider web I've ever seen in my life. Sunlight come through the window and hit it, turned all colors. It's beautiful. And I have to remember that. And Jerry said this wasn't going to be easy, because nothing in life that's worthwhile is easy. But he said, if you take our hand, trudge this road with us, Beth, it'll get better. And today I think I know what better is. Better is I can live with this. And I better be able to live with this. You know, because when I go to bed, I'm already in it. I go to brush my teeth. I'm standing there already. You know, I, I go to sit down the, on the on the toilet. I'm already seated there. You know, wherever I go, I seem to be there already. And and I guess this is what better is, being able to stand it. I was always running away from myself for so long. And And I take an inventory. You taught me that. And my sponsor always said, you know, when you take these little nightly ditties, remember if you did something nice during the day. That's important, too. Quit putting yourself down. Yeah, it's better today. And then they came. <laughs> Be glad you can pick your own sponsor. Back then we took what we got, and by God, we had to like it. And in they came. You know, and then they tell you everything you never wanted anybody to know in your whole darn life, and all they're doing is sharing their experience, strength, and hope with you. You know, and they whisper, and they say how sick you are, and all this kind of stuff, and hear treatment, and you hear this, and, and uh, I don't know, some guy said that when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I looked like <laughs> olive oil after a shipwreck, and... uh <laughs> But I managed to stay here. And uh, so they tried Serenity Hall in Bayview Hospital, and they didn't take women at all. Rosary Hall had three detox beds for women, and they had shut down for women because they were opening up to five beds, and I guess hanging up polka dot curtains or something. And then they tried St. Thomas. And St. Thomas at that time had four detox beds for women, and they were full. They had a four-and-a-half-week waiting list. So my sponsors decided nobody died on them, and by God, nobody was going to start. So we went to two and three meetings a day, seven days a week for the first year I was sober. One time, I called the old witch and told her I was too tired to go. Death isn't as quiet as it got on the other end of that phone. And then she sucked in air. And when she sucks in air, you hang on to stuff that doesn't move. I'll clear you. You'll go zap right through there. And then in that voice, she said, if you think you're tired, what do you think we are? Stop being so selfish. We'll be there in ten minutes. Ten minutes later, I was staying outside, all excited that I was going to another meeting of alcoholics. <laughs> when she jumps... Or, or when she goes like this, boy, I jump. But she, you know, she was always there. She's always been there. And, and you know, I, I remember, and i got to throw this in, I love 12-step calls. I wish we had more. We're starting to get more now. But I remember the first 12-step call I went on. The phone rang. We're in between meetings. I'm trying to go to the bathroom in peace. You know, and the phone rings, and it's her. And she said, the hand is out. And I said, the hand is doing what? <laughs> and she said, the hand is out, and we are responsible. I'll be there in five minutes. <laughs> be ready. So I went outside to see what this hand deal was all about. She pulled up, and I got in, and we drove off to this 12-step call. Now, she was explaining to me about what one, what one was like when we went on, and that the poor suffering, blah, blah, and the hand is out, blah. So we pull into the driveway, and we knock on the door, and nobody answers. So I go back, start back to the car, and she said, where are you going? And I said, nobody's answering. And she said, wait a minute. When the hand, woman is nuts. She said, look up there, at, and on the second floor, the windows open that much. 
go into the garage and see if there's a extension letter in there. I said, that's breaking and entering. She said, no, it isn't. She said, she called us. We didn't call her. And when the hand got, I said, huh? So I went in there, got one. I put it up. And I'm holding it like this dutiful sponsor. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm holding it. She said, you're going up. I'm not. <laughs> and handed me the big book. And then she hung on to the ladder. Now, she's been like she's been on a darn foot machine ever since she got sober. So she's hanging on to the ladder. And I'm going up with this, with this book, Scared of Heights. You know, and I told her that, but she came through with that when the hand junk. So I go up and raise the window and started to climb over, and I caught my foot, and I went flat down on the poor, suffering alcoholic that's laying spread-eagled on the floor, hanging on to her bottle. I didn't know what to say to her. I'd never been on one of these. And I'm this far from her face. So all I said to her was, did you call Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> she said she stayed sober. She stayed sober for 15 years until she died, and she said she did it out of fear. <laughs> Whatever works. But anyway, in these meetings is where I am learning how to live. And you taught me stuff. You taught me about if you go sit, sit on a railroad track and you wait for the choo-choo to come, that when the engine hits you, you're going to be this big blob of goop, and you're not going to care what the coal car does. And, and that's where I learned about how it's the first drink that does it. It isn't the rest. Because I could envision that thing hitting me, and that's just exactly how it was put. You'll be a big glob of gook. And I thought, yeah. And, and then you taught me about social drinking. You said you never can go back to being a social drinker. I never was one. Closest I ever came to being a social drinker is when somebody said, I think I'll have another drink. And I said, so shall I. And we got on with it. <laughs> and so, but they said, you know, we're like cucumbers growing in a garden. And they were picked and then were put into this big icky barrel of guck. And they slam the lid down. And how long are we in there? Days, months, weeks, years? Who knows? But then the day comes when they lift that lid. And when they reach in and grab you out, they said, you're no longer a cucumber. You've turned into a pickle. And there is no way that a pickle can ever become a cucumber again. And they said, now go to the store, buy a jar of pickles, keep it on the first shelf in your refrigerator so you won't forget. I still have a jar of pickles on the shelf in the refrigerator. Every time I open it, I'll look at one and say, what step are you on today? <laughs> well, if it works, why not use it? So, and stuff like that. And I was told about the action in this program that we're, we're kind of like ducks swimming on a pond and, and ducks' legs go on like that to keep that serenity up above. And they said, once your legs stop like a duck, you're going to sink and drown. And that's where action is. That's why people stand at the door. They watch to see if there's a new person and rush over and give them their phone number. And, and there's chairman and there's secretary. And, and they said, and, and they're sweeping up at the floor. Nobody ever got drunk with a broom in their hand and blah de blah So it's action is the name of the game. And my sponsor said, in the big book, is very important. That's the way of life is in there. And I will help you get through these steps. And she said, they're ongoing, Beth. You're never through. And my sponsor and I continue to work on these steps. And, and I continue to go to step groups and, and, and to, you know, learn something all the time. All the time about the steps. And, and it's, 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 it's just amazing. I think the big book is the greatest love story I've ever read in my life. And it is. It's a love story of people who were nobodies. And, and God in all his wisdom. Twelve beautiful steps to write down that we could live by. The mirror. People say in our area, don't leave before the miracle starts. 
And if you don't think it's a miracle, look around this room. Nobody in here should be here. We should be an institution. Certainly the al sitting here ought to be in the loony bin. <laughs> I don't know how you stood it. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we should be panhandling, but, but we're, we're sitting here and we have one of the most wonderful days that I have experienced in my sobriety so far. It's, it's amazing. And that's the story of the big book. You know, and I, I believed in you. I came to believe in something for the first time in my life. I wanted what you had. And I was willing to go to any length to get it. And my sponsor said, you know, after I started to believe in you, she said to me, now it's time. She said, at night you take off your slippers and you get down on your knees and you put your slippers underneath your bed. And while you're down there, you say thank you. And I said, to who and for what? And she said, you'll find out who you're talking to. You know, quit pushing the river, toots. It runs just great by itself. You know how they are with their stuff. And easy does it, but do it. And then they say, in the morning when you wake up, and you lie there and you listen to the beginning of the new day. Well, I'd heard bloom where you're planted and take time to smell the flowers, and now you're telling me to listen to the beginning of a new day. I thought you're a bunch of botanists. And, you know, and I said to her, oh. she said to me, did you ever hear it? And I said, no. She said, try it. You might like it. I heard wind for the first time. I heard rain. I heard deer calling. I, I heard ice when it falls in a storm. I, I heard all those wonderful things. For the first time, the creaks and groans in my home. It, 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 people breathing, the, it, the life that was going on in my home. And I still do it today. I figure if I do it long enough, I'm going to hear the sun come up. Try it. You might like it. Only thing is, if you live by yourself and you hear somebody breathing, you better dial 911 quick. <laughs> and then they say, get out of bed and why you get down your knees and why you're grumbling around for your bedroom slippers. Remind yourself you're an alcoholic and the problem is you and ask to make lemonade out of the lemons of life that are bounced your way today and get up and get on to this thing called living. And I did it because I wanted to be sober more and I wanted to be drunk and I found out who I was talking to and I called him God. It is, um, it's beyond my wildest um, dream. It, it's not that he's ever come down and took me out for a McDonald's or a Wendy's or anything, but it's a feeling that he's there. He has carried me through some of the darkest times in my sobriety. With, with those wonderful, it's a feeling of having those wonderful arms in to you. It, it's, uh, you know, I, I, he has never given me what I want. I've never asked him. He knows what I want. But he gives me instead what I need. And I always pray for courage. That's all I want. That's all I pray for is just courage to get through, you know? And, and I've never said, why me? Why not me? Obviously, we're not given too much in a 24-hour period that we can't handle with his grace. And, and you know, the, the support and the love and the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Truly. You know, I, it, it's just, it's a wonderful feeling. Is he, does he do things right away? No. He's slow, he's pokey, he's old, for God's sake, you know, give me in. <laughs> but it's, and, and he, uh, my God likes laughter. He doesn't want you going around like an old poop. He just doesn't. Wipes tears from your eyes and talks to me through you guys, people that I have met in my recovery. I did not know how to let go and let God. 
I, I heard you say it. Let go, let God. Well, I didn't know how. I said, how do you do that? Because I needed to know that. And my sponsor said to me, you need to know that. Before you get to that fifth step, you need to know how to let go because forgiveness will come with it. I had um, a couple things that were bothering me very badly that could have been the tra- uh, just the end. And, and she said to me, did anybody ever fix anything for you in your life? And I said, yeah, my Scottish grandpa. And she said, give me a... Give me an instant. And and when I was a little girl, had raggedy, had him tea with my raggedy. Um, one day the dog came and grabbed her and and tore off her arms and took a big chunk out of her stomach and got her butt knife hanging down on her cheek and and her her little red yarn hair was all over the place. And I I picked her up. She was a, the only thing that I really could trust. And and I took her to my grandpa and I climbed up on that lap. And I felt those big arms around me, and I held it up, and I said, Grandpa, can you fix her? And I remember that Scottish growth, and I remember those blue eyes and the safety when he looked down at me and said, Bethy, I can't fix it until you let go. And I released her. I I trusted him. That blind faith of a child. I didn't have a time limit. I, I didn't give him directions. It, it's that blind faith of a child. And my sponsor shook her head and she said, yes, and you've come as a child, haven't you? And and I could start to let go of things and and give it to my God and not give him a time limit. But no, with your love and support, and with a God who had given me a gift to live, that everything would be all right. I had a little girl that was a year and a half younger than my daughter Anne. And Kimmy got the measles when she was a year and a half old. And back then you had to watch them very carefully. Um, they didn't have shots uh, for those. And, and uh, I was in the kitchen one morning, and I was drinking. It was 9 o'clock in the morning, and I was pouring my booze into from a gallon thing into all assorted things. And Annie came out to the kitchen, and she said, Mama, Kimmy's the color of the sky. And I told Ann to go away and not bother me. And she was back in, in a second. She said, Mama, Kimmy's on the floor, and she, Mama, she is the color of the sky. And I hit Ann. The uh, neurosurgeons at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital figured that Kimberly was on her fourth very violent convulsion by the time I got into the living room. And as a result of using that much, losing that much oxygen, she retrogressed mentally to a three-week-old baby. And she stayed that way until she died when she was nine years old. We had to put her in a private home, and she was five because we had other children, and Kimberly was 24 hours around the clock, and my husband told the doctors that he absolutely could not trust her with a mother that was a drunk. I never saw that child sober. I never visited that private home and saw her sober. I never was sober when they brought her up when she died on a Good Friday when she was nine. And I never saw her sober at the funeral. I didn't know how I was going to get through that. And you know what my sponsor said to me? Now is the time to learn about self-forgiveness. She said, but God was aware of everything that has gone on in your life. And God is also aware of the fact that you probably are one of the best mothers that there ever is. But with alcohol in your life, and alcohol Beth removes, it takes away. It takes away decency. It takes away integrity. It takes away that ability to have priorities. And God forgave you and has forgiven you enough. 
to hand you a gift of life again. Who are you not to forgive yourself? And over the next months, I really worked on that. And I, I could see how God of my understanding had forgiven me and given me a, a gift of life. And I have learned to forgive myself. I am fully aware of the fact that with alcohol in my life, I am nothing. And without it, by gosh, I am something. I also had a little boy in 1970 who lived eight days and he died. He died an alcoholic. His mother drank 24 hours around the clock when she was carrying him. Always hearing that promise from alcohol. Oh, everything will be all right. Well, it wasn't. The delivery room stunk like a bar room. Unquote the doctor. There was a sign that said, murderous, put on my door. The doctor called my husband, and he said, you've got to come and get her. They won't take care of her in here. And I worked my way through that. And now today, when I go over to the cemetery and I sit there right between where Kimmy and Jeffy are buried, I can read them Winnie the Pooh, and I can tell them how my day was. And and I can ask them how things are with them. And and the forgiveness that Alcoholics Anonymous and my God, as, as I understand him, have afforded me is the greatest gift of all. The greatest gift of all. I believe amends are, are how you live on a daily basis. And that's why I, I tr- do the best I can do. I don't even try. I do the best that I can do on a daily basis. Sometimes not coming through the way I should. Sometimes making mistakes because I do. But you told me that I can learn from my mistakes and doing the best job that I can do today to repay the gift to the giver. And my amends are how I live. And and work my way through the steps for the for the first time and if the many, many, many times since. And when I have something that I have done, I will sit down and I will write it out and I will go to my sponsor and we have another fourth and fifth step in process. I did not practice the principles in all my affairs in the beginning. You know, I was a wonderful wife and mother and I was going to all these meetings and I wasn't drinking. My God, you better watch out what you do or you say or I'm going to get drunk. You know, my home group overheard it. I don't know about your home group, but my home group has big ears, and they hear everything. They're up in the lights. They pop out of sewers, you know, for God's sake. You drive, you drive, you know, you're driving along, and there's somebody in front of you 20 miles an hour in a 65-mile-an-hour zone. I know what I want to do with a car. I know what I want to do with my low hand, see? And, and I'm thinking about this, and toot, toot, beep, beep, who pulls up beside you? You who? A member of the home group. God grant me the serenity. He said, you go home and you treat them like you treat people in the rooms of AA. This is not what it's about. It's easy in the room where there are AAs. You know what it's like when you're standing in line with one loaf of Millbrook bread in your hand and four people are ahead of you with big baskets full and nobody says, do you care to go through, madam? You know, what do you do then? This is what this thing is all about, and it's at home. At home is where it's at. So I went home, and I did treat them like days. I shook hands. Hi, I'm Beth, I'm mother. And I didn't know who they were. I had this big and four littles. And and I, you know, and as it evolved, I'll tell you what happened. Now. I'll, I'll do it. I have four children who are very precious to me. They range in age from 33 to 43. And none of them drink or use drugs. And I don't know why. It is, it's the grace of God. They were never told not to. And it wasn't an overnight thing. My daughter, Anne, the oldest one, lives in Louisville, which is very, Ohio, which is close to us. And, and she has, has three of my eight grandchildren. And those grandchildren range in age from 17 and a half 
down to four months. And you want to know something? They've taught me how to run in sunshine and chase butterflies and stick straws and chocolate sodas and blow the wrong way. And and to, honest to gosh, to play Nintendo and and to, you know, have tr- have have teeth. They're raggedy. The girls underneath the cherry tree. And the boys and I sail boats. The little boys. They're aware of what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. And and I took the five-year-old. He wanted to stay all night. And I said, I'm going to a meeting, Jake, an AA meeting. And he said, all right, Graham. Oh, he loves the donuts. He wants to come back. And we were walking out to the car, and he said to me, Do you ever go to one of those in a covered wagon when you were coming across the plane? I said to my daughter, He's out of the well. That's it. I love my grandchildren. My granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, called me, and she said, uh, Grandma, I got three tickets for graduation. She said, I'm taking Mom and Dad to you. My oldest daughter, Ann, and I talk at least twice a week. I see her and the children every other week. My daughter, Linda, and her family live very close. She has four or five five of the other ones. Um, and and uh, we're, we're just very close, tight family. You know, we, all, we go up and spend a week together. And uh, my daughter-in-law... Uh, my son, Brucey, lives around the corner with his wife, Sandy, and her parents have have a place up in Vermilion. And we went, we go up every summer to our family. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, when I saw them last year, the family's intact. The older ones are taking care of the younger ones. I mean, there is no arguing. There is no screaming. There are no put-downs. You know, every so once in a while, I'll get a life or keep focused on the machine, says the 16-year-old to the baby, you know. And, uh, but it's, it, it's a time for laughter. It's time for fun. This is what Alcoholics Anonymous has done. This is what this thing is all about. Yeah, it's suiting up and showing up at meetings. Yes, it's working. My God, it's a way of life. They can't be beat. My son Bruce did not talk to me for three years. I'd walk in one door, he'd walk out the other. And, and you know what you said to me? Do what you need to do. Do what you have to do. And, and he, it's like a butterfly. If he flies away and he never comes back, you weren't meant to have him. If he flies away and comes back, you were meant to. So I went to his hockey games and I went to his little league game and I went all over the place. And one day, a very hot day on a ball mound, when I had three years of sobriety, his eyes searched the stands and found mine, and he saluted me with a ball. And after the game was over, he said, you know, Mom, it doesn't make any difference if we win or we lose as long as you're here. And I could talk to him. He's one of the finest paramedics that ever walked the face of this earth. The baby is, was 33 day before yesterday. He's still at home. Anybody in this room, 32, 33, 31, come on home with me. He's a paramedic. He's got a good job. He is, I never see him. He, uh, I was home one day because they didn't have any school early on in my sobriety, and, and uh, he came home early, and, he, and my sponsor knew they were coming home early, and he came in the house and he said, I'm hungry, I want lunch. My God, I didn't boil an egg till I was nine months sober. I went to the phone call, my sponsor started to cry, and I said, my God, he wants lunch. And, and this baseball hat, and these little eyes came up on her. He said, I'll teach you how to make lunch. And she heard him, and she said, you've come as a child. You've got to crawl before you walk. Let him lead you. So he took out the peanut butter and jelly and bread. He spread peanut butter on this, and he said, Daddy, he says, be careful. It makes holes. And jelly will drop through. And then he spread jelly on this, and he put it together. He said, now that's a sandwich. You make one. And with tears streaming down my face, I made my first sober sandwich while a seven-year-old patted me on the back and said, job well done. 
telephone. This is what it's all about. The phone call in the middle of the night from my daughter at six months pregnant saying, Mom, something's wrong. We need you. And I stayed with Lenny and her family. Uh, the baby she was carrying was dead. And, and uh, she said, Mom, we can count on you. This is because of Alcoholics Anonymous. It, it's because of God's grace. It, it's working a program of recovery. And in that wonderful man that, that I, we learned to love each other, we walked in the sunshine, we held hands, we, we learned how to dance, we uh, could talk with each other. Um, I had uh, four years of sobriety. In 1976, I sat at the end of the bed in uh, university hospitals and heard those horrible words, acute myeloid monocytic leukemia. And my soul split in two. And I thought, what is this all about? Here I, you know. And when I walked out of there, there were two AAs sitting on each side of the door. I didn't call. They just said, we heard maybe you need coffee. And from that moment on, over the next two and a half years, you were always there. I never opened a mailbox with, without a note in there from you. Uh, you came over to the house and said, is there anything we can do? When I couldn't get out to meetings, you came in with your big books and your 12 and 12s, and you took my children places. And you sat at their hockey games, and you sat at their little league games, and you went everywhere with them because I couldn't get out of the house. And I watched a man with courage. Courage, no, no complaining. Get the fullest amount that he could out of every day. I wish to God I could have handed him a book. And said, all you need to do is to work 12 steps and go to Al-Anon or go to AA and everything's going to be all right, but it wasn't. I was married to a man who was born an Al-Anon that worked 12 steps. Um, the night before he died, he said, do you want to dance? And I said, and we put on old Sinatra record, and, and I, I held him real tight and, uh, because he was down to 103 pounds. And uh, we rocked back and forth. And he said, Beth, I'm going to tell you something that I want you to pass on that I never want you to forget. He said, not only did Alcoholics Anonymous save your life, but it saved ours too. And he said, I will be able to say thank you to the man who made it all possible very soon. He said, I have no regrets. I have no fears of leaving and going home because you're sober and I know about the wonderful support that you're receiving. Hardest thing we ever had to do was to let go. And, and uh, we released him and I told the kids my story of my grandpa. And we sat there and we all released him. No matter what happens. No matter what, what little, you know, kind of places that you pass while you're on the bus or the choo-choo. And in, in your traveling this road, you don't need to drink or use anything. Because as soon as you get by some of the desolate fields, there's always flowers. And what I have learned in my sobriety because of you and this wonderful way of life it is that there begins to be daisies that spring up in the desolate fields. And as you get more sober, the skies aren't so gray. There's some rays of sunshine in there. And I guess that's what this thing called sobriety and a way of life is all about for all of us. Because it's afforded all of us, whether we're Alanons, whether we're AAs, whether we're Alateens, whether we're Alatots, a way of life that cannot be beat. I want to share this with you and then we can eat. <laughs> so I've done is eat. My children wrote this to me on March the 5th of 19, 
97. Mother, 25 years. You know, being a mother isn't easy, but it takes someone blessed by God to do it alone, to keep things running smoothly. We don't know how you've managed to do it all and so well since Daddy got sick and went to live with God nearly 20 years ago. No matter how busy you are or how much you have in your mind, no matter if your heart aches or sings, you always have time for your family to listen, to give a pep talk and a pat on the back. We turn to you like everyone when problems come along to give us a positive outlook with guidance and wisdom. Mother, you've known hard times and disappointments and heartache, but you keep a positive outlook, give us reasons to smile when we can't find one and lift our spirits when we are down. You work harder than anyone we know and do more than anyone we know to make the people you love happy and secure. You know our homes are warm, welcoming places to be in for family and friends because your home is just that. A warm place where we can be ourselves and where we know someone loves us unconditionally and understands. You and AA have taught us the value of togetherness and a sense of closeness. And Daddy must be so happy and at peace. You are a very special kind of a mother and grandmother. You have and are learning well from God and from AA. You walk hand in hand with God and AA and emulate all that is good and beautiful in life. Mother God broke the mold when he made you. Keep trudging your AA road. May God continue to bless you. Thanks for being there for us. We love you very much. And it's signed by all my children, all my in-laws, and in all the grandchildren. I owe this to you. Because without you... This never, ever would have been. And now may the road rise to meet you, and the wind be always at your back, and the sun shine warm upon your face, and the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand in the nows of each day. God bless you. Go live. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.